It is so good to see you here tonight. I want to thank you all for coming. So Eagle Forum is a conservative grassroots organization, and our goal is to promote family values and promote policies that help families. And COVID is one of those issues. I've received a few emails because we've really been pushing back on the mandates. And we have been um, on the phone with the AG's office because we were having students and parents call us when their kids were getting ready to, to go back to college. And they said, you know, they, I don't want my kid to have to be vaccinated. And so we called the AG's office and said, please, uh, what do we do? We had a law that passed that said that schools cannot make this happen, you know, cannot require vaccines. And they said, Would you, you think we should write a guidance letter? Would that be helpful? Yes, please. And two days later, they sent out a guidance letter. We're having a lot of conversations like that. We have many of you, I'm sure, are facing possible unemployment if you don't get the vaccine. Maybe you have natural immunity and you don't need the vaccine. Um, but I've got, received a few emails of people thinking that we're just a little too much on the COVID train right now. But guys, this is running our country. This is running our lives, our families. And so we're going to keep fighting. Um, we're looking at other issues as well, but um, this is something that really does affect the family. I'm really excited tonight because we have a special doctor. We have several doctors with us tonight, and I see some people in scrubs, so I know there's some of the medical community here tonight, and I want to thank you for being here. And we will have a Q&A with several of our doctors at the end. But Dr. McCorder is a family medicine doctor. He specializes in function functional medicine at his practice. It's Alabama Functional Medicine in, in Montgomery. It is there that focuses on treating the root causes of disease and finds passion helping people learn to heal themselves. He has a growing emphasis on treating female pelvic health and helping women find solutions to their pelvic pain. Yay, people. After graduating with honors from, I had to try to make a joke, that's kind of an embarrassing thing to talk about, right? After graduating with honors from Auburn University, War Eagle, Dr. McCorder received his medical education at the University of Alabama Birmingham School of Medicine, graduating in 1994. He is here tonight. He is part of ConcernedDoctors.org. They have weekly phone calls um, with all these other doctors who are really trying to push back on some of these mandates and making sure that people are educated on this issue. So before we spend any more time on my stuff, let's welcome Dr. McCorder. Thank you so much. Only one, ter one person told me they would be here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited. So uh, this is a big topic. I, I basically every hour or every patient I see, we're, we're talking about COVID and I can see there's a lot of interest. So I hope I give everybody a lot of information. I've learned a lot. This has been a kind of almost fun 18 months. It's really pushed my career. It's challenged me as a physician. And uh, we're going to talk a good bit about that. So we're going to provide um, what COVID-19, what I've seen, discuss masks and the vaccines. Um, my over, uh, overview of what I've seen, particularly, and in, in even vaccine injury. Um, and then strategies of what to do about COVID-19, because cause there is a lot to do and um, stuff that's very effective. And then we're going to talk a little bit, I think Becky's going to talk a little bit about um, rights and, and um and really, as we're saying the pledge, um, liberty and justice for all in, in these United States. We need it. This is a really critical time. And one of the reasons I'm really up here. But why I'm up here really is I, I've asked questions. As a physician, I graduated from UAB, loved family practice, loved families, loved seeing everybody from um, um, cradle to grave, as they say. But my, my career really changed when I saw a patient. There's a couple seminal moments, but my career really changed when I saw a about a young woman about 25 years old who was describing um, seeing her OB and they were recommending a hysterectomy and because uh, she described 14 out of 10 pain, pelvic pain, and it, it just was, it was life stopping. She was in bed for days. So we wound up sending her to a lot of doctors and because she hadn't had her family yet, she didn't want to do a hysterectomy. And um, so one day, I'd, I'd never seen her in pain, but one day I did see her in pain. She was on, a, on my exam table, she was balled up in a ball like this. And um, she said, what are we going to do now, Dr. McWhorter? Seeing everybody. She'd been out of the state. And I was like, we. I didn't know. I was completely stumped, completely speechless, and that's not like me. And um, 
What, but it was a good day because that day I went home and I studied something that I'd never studied before, and it was alternative medicine. So I found a supplement that maybe it would work, and I found another one. We called her the next day, gave them to her, and the next month, after years and years, the next month she was 80% better. The next month she was 100% better. I wish every woman was like that. It is a true challenge to, sometimes to take care of them. But I realized, what did I not learn at UAB? That they taught me tons, but when I got out, I, I just realized there's just more to know. This body is beautiful. It's miraculously made, fearlessly and wonderfully. And um, so I've, that's why I'm here, because I question. I, I, once I got outside that little bit of training that I've had, I've learned lots more this year than the 10 years before, it seems. So let's get started. So COVID is not like the flu. You can see up here, this is a 30-day deal here. I don't know if you can see this pointer, but on the bottom line, it goes from zero to 30 days. I see some patients out there. I've seen some patients that have had trouble out there. You know, this is the early stages, day zero, seven days. I get, I get nervous at seven days. If you haven't called your doctor, that's a problem. I think this, you need to be hollering day five, day three. You may have, um, well, we'll talk about all that, but uh, in, of interest here is this what we call the cytokine storm. COVID doesn't kill you. Your body's crazy reaction to it kills you. I had a colleague, he talked to someone at UAB, they said that 7% of Caucasians cannot stop this cytokine storm. 40% of blacks. That's a huge number. So if you, that means if you get infected, 93%, if you're a Caucasian, you might do okay. Those 7% are who's in the hospital right now. And there are people right now who cannot breathe. So subsequent and following that is what's called microthrombosis, which is little baby blood clots all through your system, down in your feet, everywhere, in your uterus. But this is what people generally die from. So this is, this is lungs, this is early on, and as you see it progresses through here, they just get gunkier and gunkier and gunkier. This might be getting better, I don't know. See all the fluid around the heart? This is a bad disease. If you think it's not, you're wrong. It may not be for you and your neighbor, but that neighbor could die. So Stanford um, uh, researcher put some of these together. This is from the CDC actually though, because on the other side of the coin, it's really not a big deal. 99.997% of young people will get through this. That's a lot of people. Statistically in healthcare, we call that zero. So if you're zero to 19, there's a 0% chance you'll die from that. And by the way, there, there have been about 300 or so deaths in children. They all had comorbidities. Comorbidities means something else was wrong. Over 70, the numbers are more like 94.6. So that's a big number. In, over, more people have died over 100 years old than under 50 years old. As you age, your immune system changes, you have other problems. The average age of death in the U.S. is 70, is I think it's uh, 78.6 years old. In the time of COVID, you know, it's still 78.6 years old. It hasn't moved. I find that interesting. So I want to point out a couple things about the flu. So can y'all see these? Okay, each of these lines represent how bad was the flu that year. So 2011, 2013, 15, 16, 2018. Here's 2020. And then last March, right before turkey season, this said, shoop. But look here. This is 2021. This is this past year. It's like zero. What happened to the flu? Well, here's where it's, here's, a, here's 20, the winter of 2018 or 2019, however you call that. Here's the winter of 2020. And here's the winter of 2021. Kind of interesting. In, in Jul July 21st of 2021, the CDC announced that the test kind of quietly put it out there, couldn't tell the difference between the flu and COVID. I'm not saying it's all flu. The disease is different. There is a difference. But it has, a, so to put it in perspective, those ugly slides, those terrible lungs, people we've lost, we've all lost people, I feel like. Certainly doctors have patients. But um, it really is close to the flu. So if you're scared to put your child out into the world, were you scared in flu season? You know, if everybody had it, you might be a little nervous because you know it could be bad, but think of them as really similar. So there was a lot of um, encouragement, let's say, for doctors to put COVID down on death certificates. They actually got emails, they got some instruction, basically, 
And um, I guess to keep accurate numbers, let's say that they wanted them to put COVID if, if they had COVID. They had a shark attack or a motorcycle accident and they tested positive for COVID, they put COVID. So when, um, when, when Minnesota lawmakers went to drill down, really how many were there? Um, it, it dropped the number 40%. So the number you hear, I think 600,000, or well, I don't know where we are now, honestly, but um, th that number is not quite the same. So we're t there's COVID and then there's not really COVID. So Geneve Briand, she's at, she's at Johns Hopkins, Applied Economics. Um, she critically analyzed all the deaths last year. This is not Delta, but this is last year. And really did some great work here. If you see here along the bottom in the gray, well, here it is right here, versus the previous week, there was a drop of 530 deaths due to these problems, all the normal ones. This is how our great grandparents died, this list here, down 530. But that same week, COVID was up 486. The next week compared to this one, it was down 2,500 in the normal diseases. The next week, COVID, I mean the same week, COVID was up 2,561. It's the same number. Here, 1,600, 1,651. So what does that mean? There was no change really in the death rate last year. Again, 78.6, then 78.6. So to support this concept, the CDC themselves say that about 6% of people had no shark bite, no motorcycle accident, they had just COVID. But that number is not really true. A lot of people on the, the side that says it's no big deal will quote that number, but that's really not accurate because it might be um, uh, COVID, respiratory failure, pneumonia. All those are really true when you die of COVID. So, and if they put pneumonia on top or what have you. So it's not all of the people, but um, some have, co most have comorbidities, but some don't. Some just get dang sick and, and die. After 18 months of studying COVID, this is what the CDC says. They say, get vaccinated. They say, wear a mask. They say sticks, stay six feet away from others, and they said to avoid crowds and to wash hands often. That's all well and good. But after 18 months, do you think all the doctors in the world have not come up with some solutions? We're going to talk about that. So this is Dr. I love this site. This is Dr. Pierre Corey. He's not some fly-by-night doc. He's actually... Um, well-researched, incredibly well-researched. He's prolific. He's, I mean, speaker. He's talked in front of the Senate, I think, a couple times. You might have heard him talk about ivermectin. He's a pulmonologist. He's a critical care specialist at a teaching hospital. And he can talk ventilators and, and all this stuff. But this is his prevention list. This is very similar to mine. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but these are outstanding. These are outstanding um, advice for all of us. So just look at the CDC. Why do they say what they say? So talking about masks and, and social distancing and how effective they are. So this is their research. This is published on their Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. This is what doctors learn to see, hey, what's happening? What are people dying of? Shark bites or whatever. So it, it really is detailed. It's, it's interesting. This is what nerdy doctors like to look at. There's 154 case patients here. There's 160 control patients here. So this is the people that had COVID. This is the people that did not have COVID. So if you stayed on this side versus here, they want to know, did you go shopping? Did you go to a salon? Did you go to a gym, um, bar, coffee shop? Very little difference. Going to a bar was a little bit higher. But here's where, whether you wore a mask or not. So if you wore it sometimes, there's 11 cases with COVID and seven that didn't wear one. If you wore it often, it was 22. And if you wore it often and didn't get it, it was 23. To me, those numbers are the same. If you wore it always in your car, in your home, by yourself, in bed, there was 108 and it, that got it, wearing it always, by the way. That's a lot of mask wearing to get, it, get COVID. And then 118, if you, um, if you never wore, if you always wore a mask but didn't get COVID. So yeah, they did a little better. So wear it always, you might have a 10% drop. That's not, that's not worth it to me. I haven't really put a mask on. I've put it on with patients that were truly nervous. I did it for them. 
a couple stores I just had to go into early on. But uh, uh, this is things Anthony Fauci has said about masks. I don't want to read all of them, but he's told me, don't worry. He said, I mean, not me. He's told us, don't worry about masks. Uh, masks, no crowds, physical distancing, good hygiene, and no doubt you'll be safe. Um, wearing a mask will make everyone feel better, and it might guard against a single droplet, but it's not providing protection. Wear a mask, he says, and then put a cloth mask over it a little later on. And then now the science shows that even people who are vaccinated are spreading this disease. So put a mask on, and if you're in a big crowd outdoors, put a mask on, even if you're vaccinated. So CDC does say that cloth masks don't work. Johns Hopkins, we know that wearing a mask outside healthcare facilities facilities offer little, if any, in protection from infection. In many cases, the desire for widespread masking is a reflective reaction to anxiety over the pandemic. And so, and down here, they may actually increase the spread of the virus. The WHO stands by recommendation to not wear a mask if you are not sick or not caring for someone who is sick. That was early on, they've, they've changed their position. I think this is the best mask study, well footnoted. Um, Lots of research, you can just, you could spend your whole Friday night on this paper alone. I haven't done that, but close. Maybe Thursday night. Dr. Drone, Drone Adams, by the way, this is, this is um, our Surgeon General, he tweeted, when I heard about masks and COVID, I started looking at mask studies. There's 65 mask studies that say it does not work for viruses, colds, flu, etc. So when he tweeted this, I, I was like dead on. The Surgeon General, he said, seriously, people, stop buying masks. They're not effective in pre preventing general public from corona, but if the healthcare providers can't get them to care for sick patients, it puts them and our communities at risk. Well, what about COVID and good masks, you might ask? Well, what about 6,000 Danish people? They actually gave them the masks. They made sure they were wearing them. So 3,000 wore it, 3,000 didn't. You know what they found? No statistically significant benefit. That's the study we want to hear. Does it work, does it not? The CDC also tells us to get a flu vaccine. Well, does it help? Well, let's ask them. Let's ask the Department of Defense. Let's ask, ask the Pentagon. Because they ran a test showing that when they gave a flu vaccine, it increased your risk of coronaviruses by 36%. That was 2018, that's not COVID, that's, but COVID is a coronavirus. So you can get one if you want to. I'll tell you a better way. So COVID vaccines, it's in quote because they did change how we vaccinate, or this is, this is a little different. So what does, the COVID, um, what does the CDC say? Basically, the results are reassuring, they say. So the side effects you might see, swelling, redness, pain, fever, headache, tiredness, muscle pain, chills, and nausea. You better believe that's all true. But you'll also see more COVID, interestingly. So this is day zero, and then 15, and then 30 days since the vaccination process. And this is test for COVID. You see this hop? That's pretty interesting. Because they're not injecting you with COVID, but now you're, you will test positive for COVID, but they're not injecting you with the stuff that turns you positive. These people are getting COVID. So if you look at the actual study at Pfizer, I read this when it first came out, I was like, whoa, this is so cool, let's see. I saw this immediately. At the same time, I'm hearing that it's perfectly safe. And, and so effective. I forget what number they said. 99 or 97% effective. I said, oh, okay, well, really? So I look right here. Severe adverse events. This is 21,000 people that got the shot. And this is the, the um, 21,000 people who didn't. They got saline in their arm. So the 240 versus the 139 of adverse events. So that's like, I don't know, I'm not great at math, but it's like almost double. So, and we're talking about severe problems, requiring assistance, transport to hospital, hospitalization, death. It's not a big number, but neither are the COVID numbers. So we've got to keep that in mind. Another interesting thing, after just two months, they dropped the control group because they gave them a vaccine. They wanted to, quote, reward them. Okay, and, and maybe, that's, maybe that's fair and right. But they signed up to be in either and, and got either. And then, but just two months. It was already waning 6% per month. And then so when they gave them the vaccine, what did we lose? We lost our ability to compare the vaccine, the vaccinated to the unvaccinated. We don't have that data now. Now that's us, the rest of us. 
that they talk into vaccinating. So are COVID vaccines riskier than advertised? That they're just fine, sore arm? This one I have particular attention to. I, this one, I literally couldn't believe it. So the Japanese asked for these details and they got them. So at 40, 48 hours, it's 64 times more concentrated in a woman's ovaries. Is that important? I don't know, we'll never really know. We can't watch the, co the control group. So there's an ovary and there's a fallopian tube. I think that's just incredible. By the way, the fallopian tube doesn't actually touch it. It just goes right up next to it. So this was Israel's research, the most vaccinated country in the world. So Seligman here, he's got 100 peer-reviewed um, international publications. He has, he's a biomedical researcher from Israel and Luxembourg nationalities. He's a digger. He digs and digs and digs. So what, what does Israel show? His stuff's in the gray. So this was stuff that was known, and this is stuff he extrapolated from the data when this wasn't really clear. That, for example, this many people died, and this many people died. 1,500 versus 709. Well, that represents a group of nearly, well, 358,000 people, where well, that group's only 51,000. So what is that talking about? So if you look here, if you look at how many people die per day out of 10,000 people, it's 0 0.5 people. That's just how it goes. Y'all will be there one day. We're all going to be there one day. After the first dose of the vaccine, though, it's 6.18 people die. Out of 10,000, it's still a small number, but that's a real number. Second dose, dying within seven days of the second dose, 14.8. Then after that first week, it drops to 7.95. By the way, the other place that it was severely highly concentrated, the spike proteins, so they inject it in your arm, 25% stays in your arm, and 75% goes throughout your body. The other place it was high in was in the spleen. It was even double. That's good. That's the trash can. We want that out. That's where the body's sensing, what is this? What do I do with it? So we kind of want it in the spleen. Okay, those are real numbers. That's with a lot of people, hundreds of thousands. Since Israel's been heavily vaccinated, they should get better and better because it's so good, right? It's like 99% effective, right? Here's their first, then their second. This was March, and this was the fall, and then winter. And then look here now. They're worsening. There's doctors over there saying the vaccine is a, it's a failure. Here's our reporting system. So this is VAERS. On the bottom line here, I mean, these little white dots represent deaths due to vaccine prior to COVID vaccinations. This is the line after vaccines started coming on the scene per the VAERS, entries into VAERS. VAERS is Vaccine Adverse Experience Reporting System. A doctor like me, busy doctor, has to stop what he's doing late at night, get on a government website, click and clack through all this. He's got to know the maker of the vaccine. He's got to know the, the lot number. He's got to know um, a couple other things. Put all that in there and, and hope that when he hits send, it goes, by the way. This shows a 10 times increased death rate in the VAR system. As a, and this is as a function of age. So all ages, particularly maybe even higher in this younger group here. So this is a look at VAERS. Somebody compiled this data. This is from VAERS. But if you look at it, this is 1990 and this is going out to um, now, 2020. That number is near 15,000 now. If you add all these deaths together in the past 30 years, they do not equal this. Is that safe? I don't know, I'm a dumb family practice doctor. They're looking at this, they said. Okay, I'm glad. Just don't tell us it's completely safe. That's what religious freedom is about. That's what it, full disclosure, full consent. If you got a vaccine, I know a lot of y'all been vaccinated. Did they tell you that? Or did they say you'd get a sore arm? Here's a report on a two-year-old girl. She died five, four days after receiving the vaccine. Her doctor put it in there. It was removed from bears. People are seeing this, so they're now copying them. So, um, did they investigate it? I don't know. 
think it should be on there, though, because it doesn't hurt children. Now they're wanting to vaccinate our children with a 99.997% survival rate. So I want to talk about hospitals, and I don't know really here. This is where I'm confused. So I'm being told that, quote, everybody is unvaccinated. And that, I believe them. They say that, and I trust people. So <clears throat> this hospital, though, Erasmus, put out something that I found pretty interesting. Because remember that slide where I was showing 0.5 versus 6, and then whatever the number was? It says, out of 374 patients at Erasmus Medical Center, none had been fully vaccinated. Sometimes a patient fell ill um, after the first injection, but that's too early to have a reaction um, or to have a full immune reaction to the vaccine. So in, they're admitting there that they said that they were not vaccinated. Here's another one. Nope. It'll come up in a second. So anyhow, so uh, I think I have one more showing the same, basically the same thing, but it actually is more detailed as out of L.A. The people that had been vaccinated within two weeks, they weren't considered fully vaccinated. But if they died then, they were considered not fully vaccinated. And we just showed you that COVID cases go up there. So I don't know. I, I would just encourage hospital staff. I see a lot of scrubs out here, fellow doctors. If, if they're unvaccinated, I get that. I believe you. But are they truly unvaccinated? I do know vaccines have, to, have to, time to cook. But let's call them something else, like um, early vaxxers or, or something, where we know, well, they're not quite nothing but they're not quite fully vaccinated. So there's a vulnerable time period in there. We really want to know those details. So this is um, a person, somebody who looked at several people. They looked all over several places in the world, Israel, England, Germany, I think. And um, they wanted to look at the uh, safety of COVID vaccines. Their summary down at the bottom here, for three deaths prevented by vaccination, we have to accept two inflicted by, by vaccination. This lack of clear benefit should cause governments to rethink their vaccination policy. Something that's come to my attention here recently is something that Spanish researchers discovered was in the vaccine. It was called graphene oxide nanoparticles. So what are these? They may be responsible for the magnets that are sticking to the side of people's arms and stuff. That appears to be real, by the way. I had a nurse practitioner seeing me today. She said in their office they have one patient that got vaccinated. They put it to your arm. I questioned her every way but sideways, are you sure? And she said yes. A week later, it stuck to the other arm, so I don't know what that means. But you can see, uh, uh, I saw somebody sent me a YouTube where it was hundreds of people doing it. That was a beautiful video that when I hit play, it would show heart cells without graph with graphene oxide in them. And they would beat like this. Boom, 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 boom. Then they shined a light on them. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. They could control the heart rate with light or with some form of energy. This almost sounds too crazy to believe, so I had to go do a little digging. And there are, um, there are research papers on this. There's patents filed on this. So I didn't tell anybody that the Spanish researchers found that. Too easy to fool me until, um, I believe her name is Karen Kingston, a Pfizer employee, biotech, severe, one of the smartest people I've ever heard talk, describes exactly all of this and that it is in the vaccine. Oh, there it is. Beautiful. Can y'all hit play up there? So, so the white shiny stuff, bump, 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 light on, bump, 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 bump. bump. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Okay, thanks, guys. What a team. Woo! Okay, awesome. So Dr. Charles Hoff, he made quite a sensation. He has shown, I was seeing this already, but he has shown that 61% of his patients are showing evidence of microclotting. Microclotting is what I showed earlier where those, uh, those cells are, are getting clumped together. I've seen these, these, there's a test for that called D-dimers. I've seen these D-dimers that are high. By the way, they can be high after COVID. They can be high after the vaccine. So, un, so you, you got to know what you're dealing with. That is a video also. I think we, uh, um, I don't think we need to play it, but uh, you can ask your doctor for a D-dimer. 
I'm going to show you why we don't. Let me go one forward. So there is a test, a blood test we can run. It's a new test that called the pulse. And you can see these the effects of COVID. You can see the effects of vaccinations. But this is the effects we can see under a microscope. These are normal red blood cells. These are red blood cells after a vaccination. If it's near a clot, that would be normal. If it's just everywhere, that would be entirely abnormal. Here is um, the CDC recognizes this from their um, watching the, um, the VAERS that I'll point out right here, 18 to 24 years old, they're six times more likely to die from the vaccine than, than COVID. Those are still small numbers. Don't really have to worry so much about those, but they do happen. So that's, that's this group right here. By the way, I read somewhere, I can't verify it, but the military had, I think it was 26 deaths in all four branches. Somebody verify that for me? Okay. That's not very many. <clears throat> So here's that slide. I don't know why it's so out of place. So sorry. So this is the unvaccinated, not really unvaccinated. So down here it says the partially vaccinated. So partially uh, greater than 14 days after receipt of the first dose and less than 14 days after the second dose. And the unvaccinated were less than 14 days after the first dose. That's not an unvaccinated person. They're called unvaccinated, but they're not. So what if they died in that group? So if you work in the hospital, if you work, call it what it is. Yes, the vaccine didn't kick in, I agree. But if they were vaccinated, don't say they're unvaccinated. Because that would take away that 99% number. There's a West Virginia governor, I saw on YouTube, he says that in his hospitals, um, I think he said about a quarter of their patients in the ICU that just died recently, they are fully vaccinated. So who is not getting vaccinated? Because it's probably the poor Alabamians who don't know better and all that. So, well, actually the highest group is PhDs. I'm not a PhD, I'm not smart enough. Professional, masters, bachelors, some college, high school or less. I don't like the word vaccine hesitant, by the way. I'm not getting it. Nor is Cam Newton. <laughs> I forgot her name, Williams, somebody Williams, ESPN reporter. That's a heck of a job. She's saying no. So as I mentioned, data suggests that Pfizer vaccine wanes after six months, or it's about 6% for the two months. We don't know much else after that. There are observational studies, let me be fair. They can follow those people, but it's just hard to compare. They are adding two pills to, it's kind of a therapy, and then they're adding another booster about every six months. By the way, I think in Israel, as of a couple of weeks ago, about 26% of people had had their third vaccine. If you haven't had your third vaccine in Israel, you are not cons your vaccine passport does not work. If you're fully vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine, you're six to 13 times more likely to get Delta than someone with natural immunity. That doesn't quite make sense with what we're hearing in the hospital. So there's a difference in how they react and maybe they don't produce this lung deal or maybe they, weren't, maybe they really are vaccinated. That I don't know. We need more research. That needs to come out and it will, it is coming out. Here in Israel though, I mean, not here, in Israel, 86% um, oh, of the cases are fully vaccinated. You might think, well, that's because there's so many people vaccinated, but it looks about the same rate as how many are vaccinated, about 84%. Hmm. So, if you've had COVID, and by the way, there's a difference between last year when every test, everybody and his brother tested positive. If you didn't have symptoms and you tested positive, I don't know what to say. I do know that 42% of people have had COVID by antibody testing and didn't know it. I might be one of those, for example. That's a lot of people, by the way. I never had COVID. 
I didn't really see ever any need to test, but I did run my antibodies last year sometime, and they were negative. So maybe they'll be positive now. I got it without knowing it. That's actually the best thing, you know, get some antibodies. Um, so COVID-19 did not occur in anyone over the five months of the study. 52,000 patients. Five months, no one got it after that. I read another study, 43,000 people. There were two cases per 10,000. That's nine people, I think. And only one was serious. So out of 40,000 people, if you sure enough had COVID, you just don't have to worry again. So Marty McCary, he's an MD, Johns Hopkins, surgical oncologist. He also teaches public health. This guy's got a heck of a resume. Just want to kind of say what he said here. During every month of this pandemic, I've had debates with other public researchers about the effectiveness and durability of the natural immunity. I've been told that natural immunity could fall off a cliff, rendering people susceptible to infection. But here we are now, over a year and a half into the clinical experience of observing patients who are infected, and natural immunity is effective and going strong. And that's because with natural immunity, the body develops antibodies to the entire surface of the virus, not just a spike protein constructed from a vaccine. So what does that mean? Maybe like 30 different antibodies. So I'm a COVID. I have an antibody that's hitting my knee, my head, my ear, my chest. Those antibodies will help you with future variants because we hear so much about variants. By the way, Delta is more contagious, no question. The first round did not go through a house like this. This one will get everybody in the house. Okay. Um, so S Stephanie Seneff, she's an MIT senior researcher. Basically, all this says is it really looks like it's a very complete setup for Parkinson's disease. And COVID has a 99.95% survival rate for people under 70. That's out of Stanford. That's a big survival rate. And it seems to last all your life. We have SARS-1 people. Their antibodies are still kicking. We have University of Washington in St. Louis. All doctors, when they're baby doctors, when they're young and have little coats, they have a book in their pockets called the Washington Manual. They studied bone marrow. They went into people's bone marrow. They looked at blood. They looked at bone marrow. And in the bone marrow was the magic stuff that says this will last forever. Great news. I was super excited when I heard that. And I thought right then, well, the vaccine's going to lose a lot of traction. So this is Robert Malone, Dr. Robert Malone. He is the inventor of messenger RNA, said in several places. I'm not going to argue. This is Wikipedia entry. It says he's an American virologist and immunologist, and basically he's been criticized for, for promoting misinformation. This is his CV. It's the biggest CV I've ever seen. It keeps on going, by the way. I think it was 22 pages long. Your, his resume. So his resume, 20, you, can, you can hire him. He'll come and straighten your company out. If I had like a technical person, I would have put page after page after page after page and just had it all on there and showed you what all he did. It, it just knocked my socks off. <clears throat> so top doctors now are speculating a reversal on CV, COVID vaccine safety could be coming. These are mainstream guys. Yale, uh, big, big names. So here's Israel again. They're following the CDC advice. Masks, social distance, distancing vaccines, flu shots. And here's Sweden. Oh, hold on. That looks entirely different. Let's go back one. Sweden's top dog said, wait a minute. These masks don't work. Social distancing doesn't seem to work. You know, use sensibility. Don't get in a crowded room at a big church like Bethel. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what to do when, when you go home. <laughs> so it's down. And, and this is up to date. You might say, oh, that was, that was in the summer. But no, that's actually up to date. That's August 25th. And they're ahead of us because they're higher. So the higher you are, England's already done their boop. And we're, we're whoop, and we just turned the corner. If you look at ICU beds in Alabama, thank the Lord, it's been rough. But this was very predictable. Very high spike and rapid drop. So that just says if masks work, why, why do this? If that works, why wear masks? If that, blah, 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 blah. And so if vaccines, masks, social distancing, and lockdowns work, if they don't, why don't they? 
and then what does work, which is I hope while you're here and let's talk about it because there's some great stuff coming. So how are we addressing it in my office and my colleagues' offices across the state? Concerndoctors.org. So prove, these are proven things. These aren't wackadoodle things, but sunlight exposure, outdoor people, exercise. People that exercise do not die from COVID. I'm not saying 100%, but I think it is 100%. Adequate hydration. Um, this was a, a, one of these doctors right here told me about this one. This is an ICU study. I think they did like five times a day in the ICU. You're already tortured in that. Now they're doing neti pots in your nose every two hours. You got to love scientists. No sugar, fats, highly processed food. Sugar will sh shut your immune system down for six hours. If you get sick, quit eating all that junk. Shouldn't have been eating it beforehand. Now, losing weight's hard. I'm not making fun. It really is tough. With all the obesogens in the food industry, it's very tough. Eat real food. But 70% of people who are really, really sick with COVID have a weight issue. And that's unique. That's not every disease out there. That's kind of a, uh, like the flu, that wasn't the case. Heart attacks, it's really not a huge risk factor. Just kind of interesting. So prevention strategies. This is what we need to be doing. Email us for the highly detailed um, exact doses. But I want people to know vitamin D3 should have K2 in it. I like C iodine. We're missing those things. 98% of people are missing vitamin K2. And it tells the calcium where to go when the vitamin D keeps it around. So 10,000 vitamin D3. Zinc. It wasn't on my early prevention strategy. By the way, I put this up in my office back in um, pretty much in April of last year. A lot of this stuff was available. Boom. I've added zinc maybe, I forgot, maybe um, when a guy back there got really sick. And I um, added it to it and I, because I also, and I also learned that it's, it helps with that graphene oxide. So 30 to 50 a day at least during corona season. Um, that's why a lot of people lose their sense of taste. One reason is they get zinc deficient. One trick for that, if you've lost your sense of smell and it's been months, great trick, take your spices and smell them, every spice. Just smell them every day and your brain will start turning something on and start healing itself. You can take your essential oils and do the same. And zinc, take zinc. I like smart B vitamins. Okay, so um, vitamin A also, it helps it not live in your sinuses for those prerequisite three days. Helps it not replicate as fast. Quercetin, quercetin helps the zinc not get into the cells. It helps it get into the cells. So zinc is outside, we want it in the cells, then it's like an antiviral. Melatonin if you're not sleeping, not because sl sleep's important, but it's actually because it's antiviral. We use, if you're really sick, we use ultra high dose, even 20 milligrams, 60 milligrams, 100 milligrams. I've seen some interesting insomnia. Have you guys seen that? An interesting insomnia after COVID? Um, tough insomnia. What about vitamin D? Does it work or not? I've never heard a public entity tell us this. Alabamians should know this. This is why I'm here tonight. Main reason. It should be public health. They should be telling you this. This is not one study, this is a lot. There's seven US studies. A supercomputer worked in Tennessee at Oak Ridge. 67 quadrillion computations a second. It worked for a week. At the end of the week, you know what it said? Take vitamin D. No kidding. That was it. Take vitamin D. It also said that it was hyaluronic acid that was filling up in your lungs. And when I see these people, that's exactly what it's like. That's what people put in their face for fillers so you look younger. Hyaluronic acid is a natural substance. Our body makes it in response to what the COVID did. So this is an Indonesian study. I like it because it's so good. So it all, it, they showed that men, um, factor of 10, more likely to get it, or um, if you died, this is a mortality study, um, Wait, over 50 was bad, being male was bad, being, um, having other problems was very bad. So, old men with lots of health problems, you better take your vitamin D. Watch this, watch this, this is crazy. This is so amazing, y'all. 
the greatest thing you never knew about. See that death percentage right there? If your vitamin D is less than 20, and on average in this room, unless you're my patient or somebody's told you, your, your vitamin D is 25. Your death rate is 98.9% if you go to the hospital. That means you're going to die. And nothing these great doctors can do. And they can give you vitamin D then, but it takes a week to get in your system. You need it in your system a week before you get sick. If your vitamin D is greater than 30, which I would have gone up to 90 and gone on up, it's 4.1. I've been recommending vitamin D to my patients for 17 years, the year before my 16-year-old was born. A great article came out. It questioned everything about vitamins, about this particular vitamin. And all y'all nodding your head. I see all my patients. It's crazy good for 30 things that you typically die of. I, only problem you can really see with it is if you have a high calcium. So ask your doctor. I'm not telling you what to do, but I am telling you you should check up. Vitamin D3 is better than D2. I don't know about for COVID, but for all the other things, it's true. I've never seen a problem with it. Nobody's died. I can't even tell if anybody's ever had a kidney stone with it. But I do not see the flu anymore. Like, not at all. Like, maybe two cases. One was my sister last year, and Knucklehead wasn't taking her vitamin D. She always does, but she quit, so. And she didn't give it to my niece either, and the kids don't always do it, saying she got it. Those were the only two cases in my whole practice. I used to see 10 a day. So here's another one, if that wasn't good enough for you. So this is the mean concentration of vitamin D on the bottom. I like 80 to 90. My patients could do this talk right here, this part. This is where people are in Alabama. The graph doesn't go. This is a 20-country study. This is not, this is 20 countries right here. They don't even have a vitamin D as crappy as ours, because I guess we're never outside, or we, I don't know. But you can extrapolate back, I guess. That's just cases per million, just having it, just cases. And then this is deaths per million, 100, 200. So it probably goes at least up to 700. I feel like this curve may go up based on that last slide I just showed you. But we'll assume 700. So if, if you're at the average of 25, the people in the hospital right now, I almost can guarantee their blood level is 25. I always ask, what was his blood level of vitamin D? Nobody knows. You should know. Ask for it. But they'll say it doesn't work sometimes. But remember what I said, they try to low dose after they were already in the hospital. It's too late. I would still do it. But 700, and this is down towards about 15 per million. 700 to 15 per million. Does anybody know how many are in the ICU right now in Alabama? My staff not counted. It's about 1,500. If you, here they are. So this is the ICU capacity. It has gone up as predicted. It's going to go right back down as other countries up north have done that, England, Ireland, Sweden. When that number, see how many beds? These are ICU beds for COVID. This is ICU for everything else, car wrecks and heart attacks and stuff. Well, um, that's 1,500 people. And gray is how many beds we have. So that's a problem. By the way, this number is not crazy for a flu year. It's high. And by the way, they're tired. They're very tired. They're very stressed. They're mad at the unvaccinated. They're frustrated. I've talked with respiratory therapists, lab people, ER doctors, um, uh, hospitalists. And they're really tired. And some of them are mad because people haven't been vaccinated. I get that. If that's what you really know to believe. And I believe that, that the, the evidence looks like it lowers your ability to have a, um, a uh, to be hospitalized and to be sick. But is it lowering because your immune system's down? That's what I'd like to know. But what if you could do it another way that was easier, that causes no problem? 17 years of research and my own research. Redneck study. <laughs> so 1578, if you put that same math to it, it's 33 people. That's not even one per county. That's a half person per county. That means the pulmonologist can go play golf, which they haven't done. I mean, those guys, I've talked with them too. Those guys are working. So just in case somebody's in healthcare and has some decision making, 
This is, this is for y'all. There, there was a high-dose vitamin D study upon arrival to a hospital. It was 600,000 units. I try to give people 10,000. Like, oh, that's so much. I'm going, I'm going, no, it's not much. It's what I recommend to get you in the 90 range. And then this is 600,000. Nobody got too high. They went up to about 125, and they camped out right there. That's fabulous results. Fabulous. That should be in every prime ed. That should be, or whatever they're called now. <clears throat> so what do we do? How do we treat it when you get it? So inhaled budesonide, ivermectin, fabulous drug. I sweated bullets before ivermectin on some patients. I don't have to sweat bullets now. They weren't the people taking vitamin D, the people who forgot to take their vitamin D, like my knucklehead sister. Well, ivermectin, almost impossible to find now. They've pretty much taken it from us. High-dose steroids, never early, though. If you're early and, and Med One wants to give it to you, just hold off or talk with them about this. Um, because if you turn off the ability to kill COVID, it's a negative predictor. It's bad for you. And one, one of the people that's here, that happened. Don't do it early. Pycnogenol for blood thinning, Luvox, um, monoclonal antibodies. They seem to work. They keep seven of 10 that would have been in the hospital out of the hospital. And you can do your normal stuff. Let's talk about ivermectin. So this uh, Mayo Clinic trained guy, he, these are the eight things he's come up with. This horse medicine here. They call it a horse medicine, but that's a half truth. It is a horse medicine. And yeah, there's been six more calls to the poison control center, but nobody's died of it. Three billion doses later, it's still incredibly safe. Um, I think it's a Nobel Prize winning medicine even. So our government says to, uh, we need more studies, okay? Great. Remember that. We'll come back to that. I'm not going to read all that. It's over my head. But I will show you this. The blue countries down here used ivermectin. The gold countries didn't. Those are deaths, by the way. There's another study. I can't remember exactly. It was like 800 people. Don't quote me on this one for sure. 800 healthcare workers got it and 800 didn't. In the group that got it, no, that didn't get it, there was like 641 COVID cases. In the group that didn't get it, that did get it, it was zero. 641 to zero, and our government needs more studies. They would take a log from you if you were out in the ocean and tell you that they need more studies. That's not, that's not my joke, but I wish it was. Hydroxychloroquine, the red countries don't use it, the green countries do. How did that pan out? The blue countries used it, the red countries didn't. That's fatalities by country. USA is down here. By the way, I think this shows our excellent healthcare system. I really do. No, I'm not kidding. So when you get to the hospital, they're better at these other great countries. They do keep you alive, but I sure wish they'd had a hydroxychloroquine hydroxychloroquine before they got to the ICU. So we need to tell Dr. Excuse me. We need to tell Dr. Fauci, right? Well, wait a minute. He knew this. In 2005, he said, in other words, it's a wonder drug for coronavirus, said Dr. Fauci's NIH in 2005. Concentrations of 10 micromoles completely abolished SARS-CoV-1 infection. So how can you get it? Educate your doctors. Tell them. We, we provided a telehealth just because I was feeling guilty because our patients had friends and families that I couldn't get to. This is how my um, colleagues feel. They're the same. We can't see everybody. We can't give everybody ivermectin or what have you. By the way, you just can't get ivermectin now. It's very hard. I had a, I had a patient get told by a pharmacist, that's for horse medicine. And she slammed the prescription back and said, who wrote this? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> and she left. <laughs> Appreciate her covering for me. <laughs> I don't, I'd have research. I don't need cover, but I did appreciate that. They've gotten word from the pharmacy boards above them, the medical association, the pharmacy association. Uh, the, a guy on the pharmacy board sent me the thing that says, Doc, you're not going to believe this. And I was like, what? And he's on the board. And, and so anyhow. Don't take the horse medicine or the horse medicine, I mean the horse donkey medicine at Tractor Supply. 
because you might have to call the poison control center to help you with the dose. But I'm not saying I don't. I'm serious. We have pills for that. So some interesting stuff. There's new stuff. So Tricor, which helps up the, the cholesterol rafts, the fat rafts that are causing the lung inflammation. NAC, uh, we talked about this, B-propolis, wonderful statins, interestingly. I like convalescent plasma. We're not using it. But these five people, I think all five of them in ARDS, so that top slide that looked like, woo, they're terrible lungs, they got better. All five of them. So the CDC's guide when you get sick. Let's review. Stay home. Take care of yourself. Stay in touch with your doctor. Avoid public transportation. Or you can follow Dr. Pierre Corey's advice in 18 months of research and follow some of this. So my experience, I don't want to stay on that, but in my experience, COVID is terrible in some people. With my patients that have been taking vitamin D at 10,000, it's almost boring. It's not completely boring. I have had some people get pretty dang sick. I did have one patient die. He never took the prevention, I was told. Actually, he bought it the very first month, several months, several months later, while in the hospital, almost about to die, he called me. And it was terrible. He couldn't breathe. He was using his cell phone. And he, and he said, Doc, I'm dying. And I couldn't help him. Just like that lady, that 25-year-old I was talking about with the pain. I couldn't help him. It was an awful feeling. And I don't know if I'd have been there if I could have helped him. But if he'd just taken vitamin D, if he could just taken the zinc. So I had another patient die who had a urological problem. Fever, chills, urine looked terrible. He needed a surgery that a big hospital could do. This was early on when everybody was scared to death of COVID. They would not accept him. He wound up dying of the urological problem because he was COVID positive, but not one symptom. By the way, he was on vitamin D. He's on vitamin D, no symptoms, and they're treating him, they're throwing monoclonal antibodies at him, they're doing all this stuff, but he wound up dying of the original problem. Painful. Um, I had one hospitalized this year who took steroids early on. Um, I lost a very close friend's wife. She, we didn't really, we had ivermectin late, and then she really needed steroids after that that she just didn't get. Um, really on my fault, I really called to check. I don't feel like, I'll always live with this. I don't feel like I adequately followed up, and it's just a lesson. The next day, if ivermectin doesn't work, it usually does, but if you're really down the road, it's only like 42% effective. Not like 86 or 92 or whatever all the different studies say. So it's not perfect. Nothing, nothing really is. But the next day, she should have had high-dose steroids. I checked on her about three days later. She's not really a patient. And I texted her, hey, how's she doing? They were loading her in an ambulance. And she never came home. Awful. She was young, pretty young. Risk factors. Um, children. I don't even worry about children. If you call me about your child, I'll just reassure you. Do some of these things, but, I mean, but don't worry about them. If you have a new baby in the hospital and grandma, don't worry about that. Whether you've been vaccinated or not, it doesn't matter. Babies are fine. Um, vaccine dangers. I think I'm at 36 people who have been harmed in some way. Not irreversibly necessarily, although the dead guy is irreversibly harmed. He started having seizures two days later. He'd never had them. He was like 80 years old. Started having seizures for three months, and he died from seizures. They were very hard to, to stop. Were they, was he clotting constantly in his brain? I don't know. I have six people that have started losing their memory seriously quick, like this, after the vaccine. I have about four who've had chronic chest pain. I have six women who have had more painful cycles now. Um, I've had two menopausal women who have started bleeding again. Um, But I have seen problems after COVID too, long lasting, high D dimers, a little more shortness of breath, trouble going up hills and stuff, kind of limited in their exercise. So um, there is a lawsuit now y'all should know about. It was filed in Alabama in federal court and they are saying that they have a whistleblower in the federal government saying they know of 45,000 deaths of the, within three days of the vaccine. So all these people are whistleblowers. They've lost their jobs, they've lost, they've been ridiculed, some are getting death threats. This guy's a Nobel Prize winner. 
This guy owns a gym, refused to close it. Love this guy. Ian Smith. I think it's Belmar. Is it uh, Attilus or something? I bought a T-shirt. This guy was forced to close because he wasn't necessary. And I just said that exercise was one of the best things for it. So they made him close because he wasn't, um, what's that word? Um, essential. He wasn't essential. Everybody's essential. Isn't everybody providing for their family? He just bought a big gym. And um, so when his, um, but he had big lease payments. He's like, man, I'm, so a couple weeks he laid out and then they started working out. He said, you know what? I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm just working. We're going to have people work out. So they moved the equipment. The, the, the governor said, you can do it, but you got to move all your equipment in the parking lot. you got to work out outside. He said, okay. They did that for a couple of weeks. He and his partner said, you tired of doing this? He said, yeah, I'm tired of doing this. So they moved it all back in. They started working out. Well, then they came and chained the doors. The cops came, said, um, he, it was real nice. said, hey, i got to tell you, that's, that's illegal. And he said, but other than that, have a nice day. He didn't care. So he left. He started getting $15,000 fines per day keeping his gym open. So he said, I'm doing it. He cut the chains off, threw them in the parking lot. The state came and boarded, no, yeah, they came and boarded the place up. They put boards over his door. Nope, he took those off, then cut the doors off, threw them out in the parking lot. <laughs> so then they pulled his business license. Pulled his business license, can't make money now. So he said, all right, everybody's free. So he works off t-shirts, so buy a t-shirt from him. <laughs> Belmar for everybody. I got an early model that says Belmar versus everybody. They're up to like one, I don't, I'll make up numbers, $1.5 million in fines. They went before a court and they said he was personally liable for that money. So can't make a living, docking his pay, <laughs> trying to with these new forms. Anyhow, that's fighting for your liberty. Please understand this stuff. COVID is potentially very dangerous. Do not wing it. If you wing it, you'll be one of those regretting and you'll be on your, potentially, worrying about it, being on your deathbed, and then you'll say, oh, I wish I'd got the vaccine, and the, and the doctor's gonna go, yeah, you should've got your vaccine and all that. No, don't do that, that's awful. And they're too busy, they're working hard, they're really about had it. So, follow prevention protocol, at least a couple or three things, at least. Masks don't work well, if at all. Vaccines do have some serious risks and worrisome long-term concerns. Email us for any information if you need on any of that. And then, I wasn't clear, Becky. Thank you all for your time. I wasn't clear on the next part. There you are. You're, you were gonna go over that, right? Okay, know your rights. You have, as an American, you have them. Those are enumerated in our Constitution. Our governor stood up for us. I love that. After calling all of us a bunch of dummies, <laughs> now she's on our side, and I love that. I appreciate that. I really, really do. Okay. Um, we do have about 20 minutes left. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Keep it. I do want uh, Dr. Epperson. Where are you? Will you come on up? Dr. Epperson is a neurologist in Montgomery. And he has seen some alarming vaccine injuries. I just really wanted you to share with us a little bit about that. And then I'm Larry Epperson, I'm a board certified psychiatry and neurology, UAB trained. And uh, let me just say, my wife and I had COVID back in January and we were very sick, very sick. I mean, we had the flu five days and took ivermectin, took, we, we were already taking our vitamin D3, uh, zinc and you know, everything, uh, aspirin, a regular aspirin, by the way. And, um, Finally, day six or seven, we got the monoclonal antibody and turned me around the next day, turned her around day and a half later. But we survived, we were gonna survive anyway, but we got the monoclonal antibody. But what I see neurology-wise, I've seen things from a brain bleed, a hemorrhage, I've seen several of those. I've seen, mostly what I see though is um, brachial plexopathies. In other words, they get the shot and they have a limp arm. And uh, for, I'm not sure how long, I follow them for a while, but they have a limp, this brachial plexus lesion, they can't, you know what a stinger is, a football player that runs off the, the uh, field and he's dragging his arm. His head went this way and his shoulder went there and he, he stretches brachial plexus. This, but this, this invades the brachial plexus. I've seen Guillain-Barre, I've seen Bell's palsy, I've seen um, 
myocarditis, um, and uh, a lot of bad neuropathies from, from the vaccine. Um, and uh, again, uh, there, you know how many autopsies for the 13,000 CDC says, you know how many autopsies they have been? One, one. Now, I know autopsy is, is expensive, but come on, CDC, let's find out really the real core. They, they don't want to see the spike protein in every organ in the body, right? They don't want to see that. Um, but uh, anyway, but uh, that's enough. I'll, I'll get off. But uh, not at all. No, no, not at all. Um, but, um, you know, sir? Yeah, I've seen several cases of myoclonus. Uh, days after the, the vaccine, just can't stop shaking. And um, I've seen two cases of myoclonus. The, the vaccine also attacks, you know, uh, the facial nerve behind the ear, and they have a lot of ear pain and so forth, and their whole face is paralyzed. But um, again, um, there have been one, you know, there have been how many, 300 um, children have died of the vaccine. Is that right? Yeah, the first year, 320. And one, one had, uh, I think one was, had no congenital abnormalities. The other had, you know, cerebral palsy, had cystic fibrosis, or some kind of congenital inborn error metabolism. But uh, again, children don't die of this. Um, yeah, great question. And all I can say is follow the money. I mean, you have a mandate, something's behind that mandate. Anyway. Questions. I'm going to have to leap over. I, well, let's just try it right here. Will you catch COVID from a vaccinated person? Is that basically your question? Okay. Yes, that's pretty well documented. And in, in the someone who's been vaccinated, someone who has been vaccinated for a time will give off 251 times more viral load than the original COVID. So we're talking about Delta. So Delta variant makes you release a lot of virus particles. Um, that was a two-week study in a hospital, so I don't really know, but it does last. I would say weeks for most of these illnesses, they start going down, thankfully. But some people don't recover, as he was saying, neurologically. Um, is there a way to detox this out of your system, speaking of the vaccine or COVID or, or either? But both. Yeah, the vaccine. So, um, yeah, I would say we don't know. Uh, I can tell you what I would do, and I would take zinc. In the 50 milligram range, I would take ivermectin forever and, and quercetin. I don't mean that funny. I mean that because you want the zinc to get into the cells. You want it to really um, do what zinc does. For sure, those three things. Quercetin, 250 milligrams twice a day. Redneck, we call it quercetin. Yes, sir. Is shedding of the messenger RNA vaccine in your breath really real? And the answer is yes. In fact, we all shed. We're shedding in this room and we're sharing messenger RNA. So when my wife and I are near each other, we actually take that information and our body can use that. It's really fascinating. Um, it's how you pass on information. It's how animals pass on fear of things they need to be fearful of. You can kind of learn. So we tell our kids, um, be careful who you hang around because you're really getting some information that way. So that's what Robert Malone, the guy with the CV, the, the resume that was like umpteen pages, 22 pages long, the misinformation guy, that's what he did. That's what they discovered. For the, for the preventative things, what's the top three things? Well, if I knew you were gonna get really sick, and I've had people get really sick on all five, and I didn't mention one thing, did I say mold? Sometimes mold is a problem. If I knew what you were going to do, I'd say, don't skip. That's crazy. But it's a valid question, and I know men. They want to just... <laughs> D, zinc, and quercetin. Okay, is the monoclonal antibody hard to get? The infusion, yep. So that's an IV, or it's a, it's a sub-Q or skin injection. And it has not been hard to get, but... Just recently, we heard that they were cutting our supplies by about, what was it, Stuart, 30%? Though, when you talk with the company, there's no shortage. So I think they're penalizing us bad Alabamians. Well, uh, she's asked if uh, she, her, her place of employment is, is mandating that they get a vaccine. Right. Well, our governor has said they can't do that. And I, I do believe states' rights trump federal they don't have judicial powers. 
Okay. Attorney, yeah. Can I just make a, a question, a clarification on the, the law that was passed this year? It was only for state entities. So UAB or those state things. So private businesses. So if you are in a private business and you are being faced with a job loss, here's my advice to you. It's not legal advice, but here's what I would do. Is band together with as many people in your job who have not got the vaccine and go together and say, we're going to walk out if you do this. Um, more people, when they said it was FDA approved, more people started getting the vaccinations. So it's, it, I should, they're not vaccinations, the shots. So it's harder now to find as many people to be able to walk out. Well, uh, all I can say is I've seen these um, deadlines come and go. I've written letters. They're generally accepted. In fact, they've all been accepted so far, whether it was for masks or vaccines or what have you. Um, when that day comes, even in hospitals where it's mandated, they've said, you're really not going to take it? And the nurses go, no, I'm not going to take it. And then they say, well, here, sign this. And then they say, you, you know, that the dangers of not getting the vaccine. So they haven't been forced to. I would show whoever the decision maker is this talk because when I talk with people, they change their mind. And when they hear this, they go, I mean, why would they not? They don't want to lose you. They, uh, so that is a good question. The Attorney General, New York, what brands do you trust when you're taking things? The Attorney General in New York, or, or I think that's right, looked at supplements on shelves. And I, if I remember right, 50% of the stuff on the shelf did not have what was on the bottle in the bottle. There was concrete dust and, and pine, <laughs> pine bark. So that's when I started really selling in my office. So they're just our brands. Look for third-party brands. Um, we have it at the office, but we don't have enough for everybody. Just <laughs> okay, Lori, you've got a question We have over a there. store online that'll help you, by the way. Repeat. I, I, what, is, what are your options when, they, when you're in the hospital and they refuse to give you ivermectin? I, I don't know. It's really about education, and it's about understanding, and it's about research, and getting to whoever's making those decisions. I, I do know that in Ohio it went to court. The patient won. They'd been on a ventilator for, I think, months, and they were forced to give it, but then a judge over them overturned it, so they didn't have to give it in the end. Sandra? And who is eligible for Yeah, who, who is eligible? What's in the monoclonal antibody and who's eligible? It's a man-made antibody that goes after it and attacks it. it the, the spike protein. The, um, they have some, like, they won't give it to kids because they're okay. So there is a limit based on age and other risk factors. But they've been looser with that because there's plenty around. There's plenty at the hospital. I think one place is a little more strict than the other. There are places that maybe aren't as strict. I don't, nobody's, t it's not a law. They can do what they want, but they're just, you know, to ration it, they were trying to limit it, but I don't, I don't think that's a problem. Thank when, you so much. That's exactly what I was about to say. Working with them, and I'm, they didn't ask me to say this, has been absolutely fantastic. When they say they're going to get the AG on the phone, they get the AG on the phone. I believe she could call the governor right now and talk to her, I believe. So I really strongly recommend it. Just truly fantastic group. I've been impressed. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for coming. Make a friend on your way out.